So now we've been talking about gap boundaries and defects in two plus one D topological phases. Um, now, uh, as an overview, I'll have three lectures, uh, one, one today, one on Monday, and then one on Wednesday. So I think the, my first lecture today will really be on gap boundaries, and then the second one will be on defects, and our third one, uh, depending on time, I'll give uh, some applications to talk about the quantum computing. Um, and so some motivations for studying this. First, a lot of most of the physical systems, like the top bottom phases we're considering, are going to have some boundary, and it would be nice to develop some mathematical way of describing this, and we'll see like where tensor categories come in. And then also by developing this formalism, we can see how these physical systems may be used for topological quantum computing. So define what we mean by a top-level phase of matter. For, so for our purposes, we can just consider a top-level phase of matter as an equivalent class of these gap Hamiltonians. energy functions, and we want them to realize a topological quantum field theory at low temperature, at low energy. And now, one class of these the Hamiltonians uh, is going to be the Levin one model. So, some speakers have already mentioned this. The Levin one model takes a trivalent lattice. So, for instance, and then on each edge of this trivalent lattice, we place a element from the a unitary region category C. And so, some speakers have already defined what the unitary fusion category is, but we'll review some of the most important uh, most important properties. So uh, we'll start with now this fusion category has a tensor product which can be considered as particle fusion. And then uh, it also has a tensor unit which can be considered as vacuum. Uh, the fusion has associativity, um, which is given by F symbols or also known as such J symbols. And we have this category is semi simple, so every object is going to decompose into a direct sum of simple objects. And there are finitely many simple objects. So what this Levin one model does is when we put uh, these elements of C onto this trivalent lattice, that and there's a specific Hamiltonian, then this realizes a uh, top level quantum field theory where with described by a modular tensor category, which is the Grunfeld center of C. So I think we'll review that this modular tensor category is going to be a fusion category. This fusion category, the simple objects are going to be the anion the anions, the different anion labels, and then there's an additional structure of, of braiding satisfying certain non-degeneracy conditions. This braiding is usually given by R symbols, which are as follows. So we have this notation. 
So.
trivial one, the sine one, and the two-dimensional one. So we'll, we'll call these our anions here. And then here, uh, in the second case, the centralizer is going to be Z2. So there are two, uh, there, there are two different uh, irreducible representations here. We can call it D and E, corresponding anions. And in the final case, we have um, Z3, and the corresponding anions will be called F, G, and H. So this gives a, 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 some picture of the possible ball theories that we'll be considering. Now, our, our talk is focused on gapped boundaries, so let me define what that is. <clears throat> so we said a topological phase is this equivalence class of gapped Hamiltonians, right? Um, our uh, gapped boundary in a topological phase is going to be an equivalence class of uh, gapped extensions of some member of this H. Into the boundary. So if we have this original Hamiltonian H acting on the bulk of a surface, this is, then we want to be able to extend H to the boundary so that it's still gapped. Because, uh, and then, now, uh, in the 11 one model, uh, Kitai and Kong should demonstrate a constructive uh, where if you, um, given an indecomposable model category, I'll define what this is. <coughs> and we can get a We can get a gap boundary, and it's conjectured that uh, the other direction also holds. Um, so, what is an indecomposable model? So, this is essentially you probably studied models over a ring. It's the categorical generalization of this. So, essentially, we have a map from. If we consider like left models, the loss of generality, then we have a map from the product of C and M to M. So there is a left C action. Now, uh, the motivation for this is that if we have the boundary line and we had our trivalent lattice as before, then what we do is we place elements of this model category uh, on the boundary, and we keep the original elements in C on this lattice. And then using this, we can modify the Hamiltonian that uh, Laman and one originally presented, and now introduce uh, one of these extensions to the boundary. So I mentioned here that one of the important cases is when C is the representation category of G. Now we want to consider that case here as well. So there is a theorem by Ostrich that when in this group theoretical case, the Indecomposable models 
preparing one for one to one correspondence with these pairs. K omega, where K is some subgroup of G. And then and then, so K is the subgroup of G up to conjugation. And omega is a two co-cycle of So for the examples that we're considering, and just for simplicity here, well, uh, omega is going to be trivial. In these cases, there's no uh, homology to consider. And so in these examples here, we can consider the gap boundaries here are going to be given. In the first case, ZP only has one subgroup, only has two subgroups, then we have the trivial one and the group itself. So these are going to be the two different gap boundaries that we consider. And in the second case, there are subgroups. Um, we have the trivial one. One, the Z2 subgroup, one in S, Z3, the rotations, and the full subgroup. So there are three Z2 subgroups within the same object conjugation, so we only have these four gap boundaries. Now, these, one way of looking for gap boundaries is to look through indecomposable models, like here of C, but then sometimes that might not be very easy. And also, one way it, we also like to understand these gap boundaries based on the bulk theory B, not just this input category to some Hamiltonian. We want to understand it based on our topological phase or the <coughs> underlying the TQFT. So, so to do this, we introduce our Lagrangian algebras. So these are very similar to the the special case of the Frobenius algebras that have been introduced several times already. So a Lagrangian algebra is going to be an object a in this uh, modular tensor category B. And so this is an object. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't have to be unit, but it's 
it's artistic. Um, and then the second condition is that A is connected. So this means that the hum of the tensor unit of B to A is is one dimensional. So remember, uh, oh, so an, an important, another important part of the fusion category is that they're uh, K linear or C linear in our case. So this is going to be the one dimensional vector space. That means when we decompose A into simple objects, then the tensor unit appears exactly once in that decomposition. And So we can write A equals, yeah. Now, we want the algebra to be separable. Um, now, the separability condition is so that we have a co-multiplication new from to A tensor A, uh, such that, uh, so let's denote, uh, we, we can denote the multiplication using this graphical calculus like this, then the, uh, the co-multiplication will just write the other way, right? Uh, so this is the, exactly the diagram Kieran uh, Fuchs had in, the, uh, in his slides yesterday. This is, uh, So 
the quantum dimension of A is just going to be a, a, the, is the sum of the quantum dimension of the simple objects. And the quantum dimension of the entire uh, the quantum dimension of the entire category is going to be, this is defined usually as the sum of, over the simple objects of the quantum dimension of S squared. So for instance, in the uh, case of ZP, all of these objects are have quantum dimension one, so then uh, the entire category has dimension p squared, is what we're saying. Now, this, um, now the, the, theor uh, the big theorem here, we, we introduced gap boundaries in, in decomposable modules, and now we're introducing these Lagrangian algebras in B. This big theorem. by uh, David Lobb uh, is that the, the indecomposable modules of C are in one-to-one -one correspondence with, with the Lagrangian algebras. So this allows us to determine gap boundaries we can, in two ways. We can find the indecomposable models here, or we can find the Lagrangian algebras here. And oh, so the connection between Lagrangian algebras and Frobenius algebras is just that the first three conditions up there define uh, a special kind of Frobenius algebra. I think it will be commutative uh, and a commutative special Frobenius algebra. And now, we already found the gap boundaries here based on the indecomposable modules. Now, we can do the same thing now that we've found this correspondence. But the, these four conditions are a little hard to check, right? Especially the, the third one is somewhat strange. So let's, uh, let me show a couple conditions that will make easier to find. What do you mean? What dimension of the Oh, so in this case, it corresponds, it, it corresponds with the Frobenius and Frog dimension. Yeah, so I think we can all, like, I could just. Uh, I don't know yeah. more. Yeah. I think it doesn't matter in this case. Oh, I don't know. So, this can be put out some bulge of the original category. Which one? The E from the C. So, uh. What do you mean, one? So, these are the. Uh, we know that we said before that these are going to be gap boundaries, right? And so the indecomposable module categories of C, remember these are, oh, so we said that module categories are the ones uh, with this action, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the indecomposable ones are going to be the models that aren't a direct sum of two non trivial models. So so there are some, uh, we have this one way of describing gap boundaries, and then now we just have another way, right? We find this algebra object in B uh, with some morphism. Now, uh, so now we have a second way of finding gap boundaries using this algebra. And now, so first, uh, so let's since A is an object in B, let's write A as the direct sum of simple objects. Uh, 
then a first theorem that's going to help us in finding A is the, the first condition there, the commutativity, is holds if and only if the uh, if S is bosonic whenever NS is bigger than zero. So this uh, S is bosonic here. It just means that the theta S is equal to one. We've seen the definition of the topological twist already. The, the topological twist is just this uh, operating here at is equal to the theta S. Uh, so we want this to be equal to uh, this phase here to be equal to one. That's uh, it's just like if you have bosons, will be one, and if you have fermions, will be minus one, right? So uh, this is a theorem by uh, and then another theorem that we'll use is to simplify this. Separability condition. Um, now, is if, so assume that the conditions, uh, so we're given conditions one, three, and four. Now, we are one, one, two, and four. Now the condition uh, three is holds if and only if the the following is following holds. So on uh these NABC already are from the fusion rules of the modular tensor category. So this is saying something about how this uh, multiplication M is going to determine a partial isometry. So we have a less than an inequality here. And based on, uh, by using these two theorems, it's actually much easier to find the Lagrangian algebras in uh, a modular tensor category especially in our example cases. And I won't go through the computations here, but it's a nice exercise to find that. Oh, yeah, sorry.
get this a plus b plus 2c um, when, in this case, we get a plus c plus d. A plus B plus 2F. And when we have the entire group, we get A, a plus D plus F. So it's relatively straightforward to compute these just from those uh, things I did there. And now, so we see that these Lagrangian algebras that categorize, uh, that, uh, that determine the gap boundary are these direct sum of simple objects. Uh, so that's a very mathematical definition, right? We want to get some physical intuition behind these.
the trivial excitation of the boundary. We can consider also what happens if we don't get an S bigger than zero. What if we have some many of that can't condense to vacuum? Then what happens is we get a condensation in general. So we have, in general we have boundary excitation. are going to form a category. And we want to figure out what that category is. So this condensation procedure, we saw that everything in this algebra A is going to go to the trivial object of the boundary. Now, um, an intuitive guess to what that is is going to be some sort of a quotienting procedure, right? In uh, group theory, if you take like a quotient group, then everything you quotient by gets sent to the trivial object then th this is a very similar construction. So let uh, B be some uh, tensor category. So I think for now we'll, we'll say B is a modular category. We'll relax that condition sometime later, maybe on Monday. Then suppose we have uh, this is uh, a Lagrangian algebra. Then we define the quotient category. Uh, 
um, to say, uh, a person D bigger than one, so then uh, there's a procedure to do the item code and completion where uh, we just take a pair of S and uh, some uh, morphism P that is a split item code. But for now, we'll ignore this possibility. Uh, it's just some mathematical uses. <laughs> um, I think we want to analyze what happens once we take this quotient category here. And we see that what happens is in the in the case where uh, B equals the general center of C, just like for our level one model, then we get uh, we get that the resulting category B, B mod A. So remember, A is going to be in one, uh, if A corresponds to some indecomposable module map, right? So uh, this, this is the one corresponding to the indecomposable model M. Then B over A is going to be uh, equal to this functor category uh, of C module functors from M to M. So we've seen the definition of Functors several times already. Now, this uh, this category is a category in which the functors from M to itself that preserves the C model structure. These functors are going to be the objects, and the morphisms are the natural transformations between the functors. And so, this is going to describe the category of boundary excitation. So we can consider some examples here. So let's just consider this first example. So we see here that all of the E particles condense to vacuum. Uh, in the case A1. So now what happens actually is that if you have in general uh, E, J, M, K, right? If these are the anions in the quantum double ZP model, then E, J, M, K is going to condense just to the M, K now. So the, the E part completely disappears because all the E particles condense to vacuum, but the M part remains. So um, what we have is that this category here, um, B mod A1, is also going to be uh, all, all of the, just the Ms. So, in fact, this category is going to be a fusion category where the tensor product is just the composition of functors. So, this is also a fusion category where we can just add the exponents on P. And we can also do an example here where, let's take this uh, Z2 example. Um, now, what we see is that a plus C plus D, so so here are the different uh, anions in our system. Uh, so for reasons, that I guess we'll see that the A, which is the vacuum particle here, will condense to the vacuum, and then so will C and D since we have A plus C plus D. And in fact, by doing this quotient category decomposition, 
we see that um, we get the following decomposition in the work out the quotient category just by this procedure, you can show that, uh, show using the hum spaces of, say, any two of these inside the quotient category, that this is the result that you get. So we see that there are three simple objects. There's the unit A, there's some excitation here called B, and there's another excitation here called F, and what we see is that actually the category of excitations is going to be given by uh, the representation category of S3, is the category of these excitations. So 
instead of just using one label M, we'll have two labels M1 and M2. We're going to have two battery types. And then, now these two battery points are going to meet at some points. And these are going to be called uh, battery defects. And so what we'll be analyzing next time is the properties of these boundary defects. Uh, and we saw that the excitations on the boundary are given by this functor category from uh, one model to itself. Now, these uh, actually excitations are one special case of boundary defects in the case where M1 is equal to M2. Uh, more generally, what you would get is actually a new functor category, which is going to be the functor category of between the two models. So, these uh, defects, uh, yes, but, um, These defects, in general, they yeah, in general they'll be gapless because at, at the points they'll be gapless. But uh, we can still analyze their topological properties through this category here. And what we'll do next time, you can consider, is since we see that uh, for any uh, category C, there might be many of these indecomposable models here, and what we'll con construct is going to be a multi-fusion category, which is going to be the collection of all and boundary defects in this particular theory. So, as a review, the important points from today are just, we have the Levin wood model, we have an input fusion category C, and then that produces the modular tensor category B, which is the Trinfeld center of C uh, for our topological phase. And then, in the, the gap boundaries of B are, can be, uh, can be classified in two ways. The first way is from the indecomposable modules M of C, and the second way through this correspondence is by the Lagrangian algebras A and B. And we've described this nice condensation procedure between the bulk and the boundary. So the Lagrangian algebra that you have here is the collection of all uh, any that can condense to vacuum. So this condensation <coughs> describes the more general case where you can take any bulk anion and condense it to the uh, boundary and get B mod A. And you can also do the inverse procedure by the adjoint. And finally, we've considered two important examples. The first one is the CP torque code here. Where, uh, and then the second case is the uh, smallest non abelian case, where G is equal to S3. So that's all for today.
get a phase like uh, or it's called B1 and B2 here, then the gap got to the, these are called like domain walls often, domain walls between B1 and B2 uh, are, are, you can just consider them as gap boundaries uh, from B1 to the the uh, B2 bar to back. Uh, so can you consider the future of the boundary If you have a P1, B2, B3, I think this is what I'm Yeah. So, in general, it's it's a little hard to say like how you would use gap boundaries because these are like, you, you would have something like, right, you would have say these two boundaries here and then you bring them close together but it, then you're contracting away some part of this bulk. So they're in general Yeah but you don't have to think about the physical process. You can just think of a system that's on disk and there are three meters in three different phases and there are boundaries between every pair. But oh. obviously they convert somewhere in a point. Um, so like this? Yes, so we're talking about like B one, B two, B three. Yes. So this can also be done actually using this folding trick. Uh, so let, let's just if you draw it like this, it'll be more clear. Then, um, or, yes, then how about let's draw like this? Then you have B1, B2, uh, B3 here, right? Then if we if we can first fold it this way and then uh, fold it up. So it gets complicated and rather quickly, but it's possible. Thank you. 